Jay, we're on. Mate, absolute, again, absolute pleasure to have you in the studio for HR Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is amazing and uh, such a fantastic setup here. Really, really privileged to be to be here with you. Thank you very much, mate. I've, I've worked hard it and it has been enabled by sponsors and patrons. So I'm extremely, extremely grateful. Um, and friends, I should say. And friends. Mm-hmm. Mate, so you, there's a lot. We've got a lot we can talk about here. You've got a very background, I would say, journalist, mm. right? Uh, dabbling in politics. Yeah, trying to get in. To say, trying okay. to get in. Um, documentary maker, which is the first thing I want to talk about, because yep. you, you obviously, you, not obviously, you seek. Yeah. Um, and when we spoke on the phone, we first spoke on the phone when we were arranging the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, you were mentioning about, like, Sikh heritage. Yeah. And it, it, it pinged my mind, man, yeah, because... Huge, huge heritage with the mm. British British military, of which I don't know a lot. Okay. So is that what the, the you gave me the DVD of uh, Surag- Suragari? Suragari, yeah, Suragari, exactly that. The true yeah. story. Is that what that is about? That's exactly what that is about. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's a good point to start, actually. Um, you know, obviously, as a Sikh, as a British Sikh, proud of being both British and, and Sikh. I grew up in Birmingham, in inner city Birmingham, in Handsworth. Uh, and it was very much part and parcel of my identity growing up with my turban, beard identity, and my family, religion culture etc um and the stories of the fact that Sikhs had served Britain you know during empire in India during World War One, World War Two. but what the the documentary surrogary is about is a, a lesser known uh frontier battle the northwest frontier with between um modern day Pakistan and Afghanistan uh and the fact that 21 Sikh soldiers of the 36th um Bengal infantry at the time um in 1897 uh, s- uh, defended a small outpost against um, a tribal uprising. 10,000 enemy tribesmen rushed their positions uh, on the Samana, which is, like I said, in modern-day uh, tribal Pakistan. Um, and, and they were obviously slaughtered. Oops, I've hit you, Mike, there. They've, they were obviously slaughtered, and, and, and they, they fought to the last uh, against this. But it's, it's an epic battle that really has stood the test of time in terms of telling the story of, of Sikh service and sacrifice for British interests in India. If, it, if it's all right with you, I'm going to watch this, right? And I'm yep. going to do, give it, do a giveaway for my patrons. And I'll, give it, I'll, I'll, I'll give it away, if, that, if that's all right uh, Well, look, I've got plenty of copies for you. Tell me how many you need, and I'll be happy to support you that way. Thousands. Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get burning. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it, mate. That's really yeah. interesting. So... Um, when was it? What year? When, when we talking? Yeah. What year are we talking? So this? the battle was in 1897. So oh, uh, it was the height of you know Queen Victoria's reign. Uh, it was the height of um, kind of the, the kind of what I tend to call the the, the, the special friendship between Sikhs and and and, and, and Britishers um, at that time. You know, pre World War One, and, and we always you know look to to in historical terms look at World War One and how things changed. Certainly in India, but also with, with how Indian soldiers fought. Before then, Indian soldiers were not sent anywhere to fight against Europeans. They were sent, particularly uh, Sikhs, were sent to East Africa uh, by the British to, to, for service there. But they, they mainly uh, spent their time on, uh, in Afghanistan um, with, with the tribes and, and tribal uprisings there. So it was this area that was unruly, which was so important to British interests. And it's such an important part of our shared military history. Um, it's a battle that's still commemorated in India uh, every year. It's a battle that I, I was able to uh, fortunately work on bringing back into um, recognition here. So every year since 2013, we've had an official army commemoration of the day uh, as well. Uh, but it just stands the test of time in terms of telling the story of this service and contribution, which, you know, once you start scratching underneath the surface and getting into it, you can have all sorts of conversations about history, heritage, the military, the fact that, you know, British officers... Um, served and fought alongside people from from diverse cultures and religions and had that respect for them and, uh, and that understanding uh, it's a really really good conversation starter and an important part of our um a part of our uh, history i am listening yeah yeah i'll keep uh, i'll Sorry, keep talking no, no worries no so, so question for you yeah go on. um and if do you know what, if you don't well, no I, was, I never get this option i'm gonna say if you don't want to discuss it then don't but question for you is um at the moment, not at the moment, there seems to be, or there has been, especially mm. last year, an increase in uh, mm-hmm. poor look on colonialism, right? Yeah. Uh, so from you, so and, and the Sikh involvement, and not just Sikh, but any of the, mm. any of the countries that mm. ended up fighting for the British Empire, as it yeah. were, um, 
would be sort of well within their rights to go, actually, we're not very happy with that because of the yeah. way it all came about. But there's obviously things to be proud of. What's the... Can I ask what the... what that kind of opinion on it is in terms of Indian Sikh involvement in what was the British Empire and yeah. now? Yeah. With a, you know, one day in inverted commas woke isn't... A, I, I'm just using mm. that term not because mm. I, don't, I like this well. I use the term, but you know what I'm getting at. I, I, I get absolutely yeah. get where you're getting from. And okay. it's, it's, it's an interesting debate uh, and I'm, I'm always happy to have this conversation in this debate and I don't certainly don't like it. With, with when people say, oh, you can't talk about this or you have to do this or you know, it's too jingoistic or like you said, you know, it's too woke to not it, recognize whatever. It's too whatistic? Jingoistic. Jingoism is like, you know, you just kind of, you know, rah, the Brits are and, you know, <laughs> empire and yeah, all that. I, I'm yeah. doing a really, really bad impression because clearly I'm not a jingo. But, <laughs> but the point is, look, my view um, on history and, and certainly as a Sikh, my view on British uh, history, certainly with, with empire in India, is you know it's it's not black and white. It is so many different shades of grey. Uh, there are so many different facets. It's so I don't want to say complicated, but it's it's so interesting that it's it's not right and acceptable to say you know it's right and wrong. And therefore you know if you if you do research or you're talking about it, you know you're either on our side or against us or whatever. You've really really got to talk about history and these events, warts and all. So, of course, there will be different perspectives, people coming at it from different pers- you know, ways of thinking um, about empire and what empire meant and what happened and what was right and what was wrong and all that. But, you know, you, it's not black and white. And you have to have these conversations. And the way you have these conversations is by being open and accessible to that history. So, of course, I talk about frontier. I talk about why Sikhs fought for Britain. Uh, in the documentary, I go into quite a lot of detail. There's a lot of primary original research that I've done. Um, I originally wrote a book on it, and my aspiration as a filmmaker was always to make a film. Um, but it, it's multifaceted. But we have to be able to have these conversations. Uh, we can't just say it's right or wrong. And, and, and to, to bring it into the modern day and the, the, the era that we kind of are living in now, the difficulty I, I sense is... You know, there are so many, let's say, malign actors and malign entities that, you know, want to damage us and what we're about and our confidence in our country. You know, we've got to be a lot more resilient to it. And the way we're resilient about it is by saying, look, you know what, we will have these conversations. We will talk about history and empire and we won't get upset or um, or sensitive about things that we might disagree with. But we've got to have those conversations, regardless of what position you're on. You know, you, you've, you've got to delve into this. Uh, and therefore, you know, my unique take on this and coming back to, to, to part of the question that you're asking, yeah, there, there are plenty of people who, who are either supportive uh, from the Indian community, this is, um, of, of these sorts of programs and the kind of work I've done, but there are also people who, who disagree with it. Um, and they, you know, they might be the, the kind of people who, who promote cancel culture. They won't invite me to their functions or to speak, uh, which is up to them. But, you know, we're never going to, as a nation, as, and as a, certainly as a nation full of diverse communities, we're never going to be able to come together and move forward unless we have these conversations. Um, and that's always been my, my motivation, um, effectively, as, as a journalist from a very young age, is to tell stories and have these conversations. Um, when did you, when, when were you last working as a journalist? Because you stopped. Now, yeah. Right? Um, so I left journalism officially in 2015 when I deployed on operations. Um, but I've been journalistic um, since then. I've written articles. You know, I, I still continue to write and any chance I get, I will write. Um, but in terms of being a, you know, um, a, an impartial, uh, neutral journalist, um, I would say the last time was about 2015. What have you, have you, what's the journey of, what have you, have you noticed anything about the journey of journalism mm. over the last few years? Um, any, any thoughts on that? I, yeah. I have strong opinions about journalism at the moment, mm. right? They're not the most positive opinions. Mm. Okay. Um, but I also understand the challenges mm. that journalists, journalism, news outlets, media outlets, uh, have, have yeah. that they need to overcome. Um, I'd love to hear someone yeah. like you, what your thoughts on the current situation. Yeah. If there is a situation. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think, if I went back to a news, any television newsroom, I, I was a television journalist, if I went into any television newsroom, newsroom I don't think I would feel comfortable anymore. Um, I think, um, you know, whether it's because um, there's too much agenda setting or editorialization, um, or whether it's because, um, you know, journalism today seems to be more about chasing ratings rather than actually telling the story and telling the story in a very 
um, you know, impartial way, which holds a mirror up, uh, which is why I got into journalism in the first place, to tell those stories from diverse communities, people who weren't being re you know, represented in media. Um, I think I'd feel uncomfortable, which is why I've, I, I never did. After operations, I never went back into the newsroom in that way as a, as a full-time journalist, but I continued writing because with my writing, um, when I could get stuff written into the, you know, the Daily Telegraph or Conservative Home, for example, it came with, you know, with my opinions and views as a small-c conservative, um, predominantly, um, and someone who is willing to, to share their opinion in that way. And it's the, dis it's, the, it's the difference I think we have with broadcast and print. In broadcast, you have to be impartial and neutral. You can't be a card-carrying party member, whereas in print, it's different. But I think you know, we, it, the difference has again. been... Say that again. So in broadcast journalism, so it's television and radio, you have to be impartial. Um, as a journalist, as a journalist, yeah. When did <laughs> that rule yeah. doesn't exist anymore? It's, it's changed a lot. <laughs> it's, it's changed a lot because of editorialization. You know, you've got you've got newsrooms, news outlets, programs that will take an editorial line, and and, and a really you know a good example of that is probably Newsnight, for example, on BBC News. They will go into uh, into uh, you know an, an issue with a strong editorial line, and I saw this when I was you know, meaning they're taking one side or the other. That's Not necessarily one side of the other. They probably wouldn't say that, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to possibly end up defending them here. But their, their editorial line is: we're going to look at this story from this perspective. Um, and Can you give an example? Oh gosh, uh, yes. You know what? With GB News, with with the launch of GB News I was recently, ask you about yeah, GB News, there's a good yeah. example of of that. With the um, I, I read um, on how different news outlets and stations were covering the UK Australia Free Trade Agreement, for example. And as most um, channels were covering it in a particular way of saying, you know, what will this mean in terms of, you know, farmers or, what, or whatever, um, GB News seemed to be doing it in a very different way, which is talking about how consumers would benefit. So, you know, when you, when you look at a story, taking an editorial line, deciding actually what's your angle, how you're going to, you know, cover it is, is important because you're framing that, that issue or that, or that story in a particular way. Um, and, and therefore it lends itself probably, you know, again, as a habit of a former journalist uh, defending other journalists, probably not necessarily to, to show bias, but it certainly does show a particular view coming from a, a program or an entity, whether they like it or not, it will be there. Um, you know, similarly with the issue around at the moment with, with COVID and lockdown and restrictions, you know, certain shows and television uh, outlets will, will, will ask specific questions about whether this is right and justifiable. You know, should we have um, furlough being extended um, with GB News and others now that, you know, with the plethora of media that you've got, you've got this ability to look at it from a different perspective and a different angle. Um, so it's it's important to have you know different conversations and different ways of covering that conversation and stories. Um, what has happened traditionally, and certainly when I was in the newsroom working in news, was you know I'd, I'd go into my newsroom and you know it'd be like oh such and such is covering it this way, and therefore we have to go get that as well. That pack mentality was always there, and I certainly felt it. And when I was trying to bring original stories in, um, and it wasn't really going anywhere, I certainly felt actually. You know, in a live, rolling, breaking, twenty-four hour newsroom, you know, there, there wasn't much appetite for for doing things differently uh, because you're chasing audiences. <coughs> Can you do me a favor and just lower that mic slightly? Just yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, down, down, down. There you yeah. go. So you're booming through, mate. You're a Stay seasoned booming. pro at the old uh, the old interview. So it's. Uh, um, what was I going to ask you then? So, what influences how? Uh, organization chooses the editorial line <laughs> this is it it's it's your editors it's your editors it's your program editors it's your you know your heads of news um uh, and and whatnot um and you know they might very well be people who are you know oxbridge graduates or come from it from a, a very very um, metropolitan perspective for example you know all our major news uh, studios are london based for example we're here in the West Midlands. So, you know, you get a very, very different flavour of, of stories when you're London-centric as opposed to, you know, if you're in Newcastle or Manchester or Birmingham, for example. So, you know, these are all factors that come into play because, you know, at the end of the day, it will always be a judgment. It will always be a judgment call. Um, but I think, you know, we, we see now, certainly with social media and it's, you know, there's pros and cons of it, we see so many, so, so much now in terms of news proliferation. There is so much news out there, so much ability to find information and news and, and connect it to your worldview. But at the same time, we're still gravitating towards established brands, established organizations, established entities who still have that level of, you know, authority. 
um, and and position within within the market to be able to to tell those stories. Mm, interesting. Mm. I mean, really enjoying this chat already, mate. Um, GB News. Mm. What's your thoughts on it? I think it's a breath of fresh air. I, I genuinely do, and I, and I know some of the people who are working on it. Uh, and indeed, uh, the director of television there is uh, a former colleague of mine um, as well. Um, but I think it's it's just it's it's long overdue to have a channel that's just more positive and, and, and certainly wants to approach stories more positively, but also do things differently as well. So I've I've got high hopes, um, and I hope that they they continue going the way they're going because I think we need it. We need a bit more positivity about what we're about as a nation. Yeah, I was talking to the <coughs> I was like I had it. I don't. <coughs> I've been BBC. And I stopped watching the BBC. When I stopped watching the BBC and I stopped going, I even, I've even blocked it from my browser. So if I type mm -hmm. in BBC on my browser, it's got this comedy, like granny picture comes up. And it's, ah, ah, no way, <laughs> Jose, go back. And I can't even access it, right? And again, that's not, uh, it's not a particularly, a, a, I'm not like particularly slagging off the BBC. Mm -hmm. It's more because Sky are the same, for example, right? It's more, I was getting frustrated at the complete one sidedness of. This yeah, that. I mean BBC blatant, blatantly like far le hard left, man. It's like Jesus Christ. Don't get me started. And I just want, <laughs> yeah. I want impartiality. Yeah, like I understand that there are going to be certain articles or certain journalists or certain things that are going to have one are going to swing one way or the other. Mm. You know, mm. left or right. I understand that you're going to get variation throughout an organisation, right? Yeah, whatever the organisation is. What I don't want is things to be blatantly mm. wholly. One way or the other. I want it partially. Sky does the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, going back, right? Sorry, what? Yeah. I feel strongly about this, right? So I was trying to, so I ended up having, I thought, right, I'll have a look at GB News. And uh, my first thoughts were, before I even watched it, is like, again, what are the, what people do are, think mm. who who is completely against it is it okay first off it's got gb in the name mm. so it must be right wing you know <laughs> and in the back of it, i think what is it going to be like <laughs> and you see you see you see the names and i flicked it on i had it on i, I couldn't get it on i've got a roku um tv stick. yeah yeah, yeah. I, I haven't got sky or anything uh -huh. pikey i don't watch my tv <laughs> so i had to get up my browser i had it on for a morning i thought i'll stick it on and see what i think just just in the background yeah. I, I don't do that with anything i'll put sky on sometimes in the morning for 10 minutes only because sky is the only thing on my mm. tv that does news right <laughs> Add it on. First off, it's a bit rough, a bit rough around the edges, right? Yeah. A bit rough around the edges, okay, in terms of production. Mm. But again, startup probably hasn't got access to loads of funding. Yeah. Second off, um, I was very fortunate to catch the clip of, I can't remember her name, is it Gloria? And she, I don't know if you saw this on the news. Uh, it, was in, it was in the Metro. But mm -hmm. she, they, they, it cuts from one, whatever scene, not scene, story, whatever, comes back to the newsroom. She sat there with the other guy, I forget mm. the names. She doesn't realize they're on. She knows they're about to come on, so mm. they counted in probably. Mm. She gives double birds to the camera. Oh. Oh. She goes, <laughs> and then she says, she, <laughs> yeah, brilliant, mate. And then she Oops. goes, oh, I'll come back. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, can I just see what I just saw? Probably flipping like, a bird to someone in the gallery. Quality, it was quality, it was yeah. quality, right? Yeah. Um, that was, that, so that amused me, but, what I did like about mm. it, it was you had the variation. Yeah. It wasn't all left. It yeah. wasn't all right. You had variation. To be honest, I didn't notice it was overly all positive stuff. I didn't notice that, but there was variation there. Mm. And that's what I liked. And the other thing about it was it's something else. It's mm. it's something, it's an alternative option to yeah. the mainstream, not the, not mainstream, the main stuff out there. Because mm. you know, people, well, I'm sick of it. And that's the only reason I put it on mm. is because it's something different. And then I exactly. like Exactly. Now, exactly that. And I've not gone back to, to watching BBC or Sky. I mean, my age old habit was to have one of the live rolling news channels on in the background. J Sorry, just as a caveat. Yeah. Like, I have journalist friends, as mm. you do, you're mm. a journalist yourself, mm. um, or were. And I, uh, you know, and some of them work for some of these organizations. Brilliant. Mm. I'm not slagging you off, but, you know. Mm. But I, I suppose what what, it, what it's a recognition of is the fact that, <laughs> that you know, wasn't a very good uh, <laughs> disclaimer. No, but you know, <laughs> like, within traditional media, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started on the BBC, <laughs> but um, genuinely. Um, but I suppose what the recognition is is that you know you have that pack mentality. You know, journalists have the pack mentality. You know, why have they got that exclusive? Why have they got that interview? Why do we not get it? You know, something happens and it's always you know 
um, from my experience of, of, of working within the newsroom, it's like, you know, the top five people that you're going to get on are, are, are always usually the same people. So where are the different, different, you know, different diverse voices? But the key thing, I think, is, is, is timely and, you know, not to overpromote GB News. If anybody else is doing this out there, I think it's really important to, to recognise them as well. But it's the fact that we've got to a stage now where, you know, when I was news producing, producing packages, you know, packages were 90 to 120 seconds, two minutes. You've got two minutes to tell a story. That's no time, really. And what I'm liking now, more and more now, is we're, 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 we're going in a direction where actually um, we're spending more time delving into stories, individual item stories, issues, and spending longer debating and discussing it. And, and really, that's the, you know, there's more journalism within that. You know, spending five, six, seven minutes in one segment about one issue and with that forensic Q and A, getting to the heart of a, an issue, rather than saying, "Okay, we've only got two minutes for this. Let's, you know, ask the top questions and go for that gotcha moment that we can replay again and again and clip it up and put it on social." You know, I think there's a genuine appetite now out there for people who want depth in in the information that they're being presented, and they want a bit more, um, you know, a bit more integrity in the questioning to find out the truth of of what people's positions are really, and that's refreshing. How can that be achieved, though? And how can that be achieved, or how can we get media news outlets uh, to do that mm. when it's not what generates the money? Now, this is the thing. So, it's the job of the BBC as a public service broadcaster. They don't have to worry about advertising and ad revenues, you know. But they don't do it because, again, you know, my opinion on this is, you know, and we see this, the, you know, the BBC was chasing gongs and chasing awards and wanting to be, you know, Channel of the Year and whatnot. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we don't get that depth um, with, within the stories that we should be getting, but also then the position and the editorialization is always there as well. Um, and and it's, it's, I think it's, it's got to be a recognition that actually, you know, what do your audience, what does, what does a customer want, but also what's good for public debate? You know, we could chase, you know, uh, headlines or you can chase, um, you know, ad spend all day long. Traditional media is a dying media. It's all, you know, a lot of it now is digital. It's on social. But, you know, what sort of a country, what sort of debate do we want within our country? We want something where people are properly informed about what's been going on. And the Brexit issue is a, a really good example of this. Not surface level, not the kind of the slogans that we know you get used on campaigns all the time, but actually have a bit of deeper understanding on the issues and how it impacts them. Um, and, and, and Brexit is always going to be a really good example of this in terms of how people in the Midlands and the North saw our relationship with Europe as opposed to how metropolitan elites down, the south, down in South and in London saw our relationship with Europe. And there was always going to be a difference there, but we never properly investigated that. Go into that then, because I don't know. Mm. Explain. Mm. Explain. Can you elaborate on that, please. Yeah, yeah so, so where I'm from, um, in, in, in the West Midlands, in terms of areas like Sandwell, for example, Wolverhampton, Warsaw, Dudley's a really good example as well. Um, it was the fact that people thought, you know, we, we're, not, um, we're not benefiting um, from, from that relationship. We're spending a hell of a lot more money sending it to, to the EU. What are we seeing here in terms of jobs, investment, growth, and also the ability to make those decisions locally as well? Um, and, and therefore, you know, you could see why a lot of people in traditionally working areas um, were were supportive of um, leaving the European Union, you know, controlling our own immigration issues here as well. Um, you know, but f for for a very long time, you know, if you if you only ever watched a channel um, like the BBC, you you wouldn't think that those views were prevalent. You'd think actually, you know, uh, it was very much about how important the union is and what it does for us. But you know, we've for far too long we've had far too many people's voices not going heard. Um, and, and that certainly that vault was an example of, of, of them having their say. It's also about stability, right? I didn't realise this. I think it's also about how you, your desire for stability. And um, I was talking to shortly after. Uh, well, I said was talking to shortly after the the, the Brexit uh, yeah. vote, you know, and it's like holy shit, <laughs> we leave it, and we voted to leave. I was talking to someone who is from I'm not going to say the gender, right? Because mm. they don't want to because they may know who they are. <laughs> Uh, from a very, very well-off family, very, very well-off family mm -hmm. in a part somewhere not too far from London. Um, and this person absolutely could not believe, could not believe that the vote had been lost. Couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Because all they saw was, everyone I know, everyone I know mm -hmm. is wants to stay, wants to remain. I was like, man, like most people I know wants to leave. Mm -hmm. Now, one Mm -hmm. That person is not from the same class of no. society as I am, right? Yeah. Definitely not. And 
it, I, it, it was interesting to me because when I, when I, I was just, I've thought about it over the years. It's like, it's a, when you, when you are, when you are uh, more, uh, um, what's the word? Um, you can impact, you're more influential on, mm. on a business. Mm -hmm. um, you're a CEO or you are higher up the tree in a business, you know, a senior manager or whatever you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're, it's in your interests for stability and the external inf factors yeah. that can influence yeah. your organization. Even at the pestle analysis, mm. like political, economical, sociological, flipping, what is it, uh, technological, legal, and environmental. Mm. Yeah. It's in your interest to maintain stability. So for the minority of the UK who are mm -hmm. have the majority of the money, yeah, the, high the, up, the higher up the class mm. you go, yeah, the more important stability is to you, financial stability is to you, political stability is to you, economical stability is to you, mm. then the less you want change, mm -hmm. like leaving the EU. But the reality is the, the people uh, the, uh, in the vote, the majority yeah. of people in the vote, they aren't those people. Yeah. You know, if we, I, there was a lot, there was a lot of class was brought into it, um, in, in, uh, it, you know, into the whole, in the build up to that, uh, Brexit. I did not think we'd be getting to yeah. Brexit, by the way. Sorry. Really? I did not really? think we'd get out of Brexit, but <laughs> <laughs> we were on to it now. But it was, um, a, a lot of, yeah. you know, class, class politics came into it and there's more, there's yeah. more people who aren't, haven't got a lot of money. There well, is, a, I've got a yeah. lot of money. And at the time mm. people wanted change. People yeah. were not happy. And when it's an opportunity to change, it may not have been mm. the EU that's caused all the mm. issues, but it wasn't the EU that caused all the issues. But the, the, the debate in, a, in, an o in another way is continuing on, though. It's the, the whole levelling up agenda, the fact that, you know, the government is, the current government is, is you know, looking to invest in, you know, in the North, in the Midlands, you know, with uh, jobs, uh, housing, and of course, you know, those sorts of things are, are really more important now with post-COVID and the recovery. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a recognition, actually, that a large chunk of the country for a very long time um, wasn't getting those opportunities and those investments, whether it be transport, whether it be, um, you know, creation of jobs. And, and, and so there is a, there's a clear agenda that that's being delivered on. But again, it, it goes back to, you know, fundamentally it goes back to the fact that, you know, people are different and diverse um, up and down the country. And, and, you know, having that ability to listen and understand and, and be able to articulate um, is, is really important. It's certainly the reason why I got into journalism. Like I said, you know, growing up in the city of Birmingham, um, I always felt that no one was interested in my story, my community story, or what was going on in 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 in, in those sorts of areas, and and that's what really got me into wanting to write my own publication in the beginning. When I was sixteen, I got funding from the Prince's Trust, um, and my my writing career started from then, and and the rest in terms of my journalism, you know, carried on from that point. Classic question about your experience growing up there. Yeah, uh, have you ever lived in any other, or, or spent significant time in any other major city, or lived anywhere else during your life? Yes, I have. Um, so um, I left Birmingham at the age of 18 to go to university, uh, London. I was at Brunel, uh, Uxbridge. And um, after, well, during my, my, my undergrad, I, I did a year abroad in, in the States. So I went to New York and Washington. Um, I worked in Washington, studied in New York. Um, and then when I got back, uh, carried on, I did another year in London. And then when I qualified as a broadcast journalist, I, I, I worked all over the country with ITV. So Devon and Cornwall through to, um, I was in Southampton for a period in Nottingham, uh, London again as well. So I've been around <laughs> quite a bit. So here's the question. Yeah. Is that, uh, do you think that you, there are higher, uh, do you think there is, it's areas in cities like where you grew up, mm. a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a huge population of people who aren't uh, British white. Mm. Okay, because obviously, you can get yeah. British, not white. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Obviously, right. Do you think uh, that in, in that environment, we get lots of different cultures, um, that there's, it's more, uh, what's the word? There's less chance, there's, there's, there's less instances of racism or more. And when I say, I'm not on mm. numbers, but percent, percentage wise. Yeah. Like, because, yeah, that's my question. I won't waffle on uh, it. It's an interesting one. I think, you have, you know, you have areas or communities that are diverse where people live side by side um, that m might not necessarily, you know, be more um, more harmonious than, than you'd expect or imagine because people aren't talking to one another. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. You know, regardless of where you live, whether you live in, um, you know, Sutton where I am at the moment or 
hands of where I grew up. If you don't chat to your neighbors who, who might be from different walks of life or different, or indeed it might even be like you, might be from a, you know, my, 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 my neighbors who are Indian when I was growing up in Hanswell were from different parts of the Punjab. They might have been Pakistanian from the other, other part of Punjab uh, in Pakistan rather than India. They might have been from other parts of India. Um, but if you don't talk to them and you don't break down those barriers, of course you're going to have those issues, you're going to have those tensions, you're going to have that lack of understanding and what it comes down to at the end of the day, whether you have got diverse communities living side by side or not, or you've got homogenous communities, uh, is um, you know, you've, you've got these issues when people aren't talking to one another, they don't trust one another because they don't know one another. Uh, and it's interesting c connecting it to crime and, and something I discovered a very long time ago actually, but it was always in the four of my mind when I ran for, uh, recently for Police and Crime Commissioner was that, you know, crime goes down in areas where there's neighborhood watches. Um, researchers found when you have a neighborhood watch in an area, you know, crime tends to go down. Not, ne not necessarily because, you know, you've got people out on the streets and they're patrolling and they're keeping criminals away. It's not, it's because people know one another's names. They, they, they say, hi, Derek, hi, you know, John, hi, Steve. More cohesion. Uh, more cohesion, and they look out for one another. You know, and, and, and I can certainly think, you know, where I live currently at the moment, you know, I can walk up and down and everyone knows me now because I've been <laughs> putting leaflets through their doors with my name on it, trying to get elected. But the, <laughs> the point with, with that is, you know, I know all my neighbours and they know me and we can say hi to one another and, you know, uh, you have that cohesion, you have that cohesiveness. Uh, and that's what, you know, makes a big difference in your communities. It makes a difference when it comes to crime and criminality, people looking out for one another and making sure, you know, Betty next door who's who's just had an hip operation is okay and she's not being, you know, she's not having any problems or um, the kids that are a bit, you know, raucous and they're always playing out front are okay and, you know, no one's bothering them, etc. because you look after your neighbours. And, you know, where you have um, diverse communities living side by side, it's, a, it's exactly the same. You know, people need to talk to one another. And when they do, you can find actually communities coming together because of that cohesion. Mm. That is interesting on the neighborhood watch mm. front. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Because but it's, let me give you another thing as well. Like I, I mentioned, um, you know, I, I, I spent quite a bit of time in Devon and Cornwall. Um, and, and, you know, coming from the sort of background I come from as, as a Sikh, confident in who I am and my appearance and, and me as a person you know I never had any problems talking to anyone on, of any background and, and and you could probably imagine some parts of uh, rural Devon where <laughs> it might be a bit strange where someone who's you know very different to to, to the locality comes up and <laughs> says hi and all that so I've, I've had a few interesting uh, conversations in my time have you tried that in the Welsh Valleys yet <laughs> yeah, not in the Welsh Valleys <laughs> no 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 um, but uh, it, it nearly got me in trouble a couple of times actually but I was also a very nosy journalist looking for stories as well so you know they probably wouldn't have been wrong to try uh, when they did report me to, <laughs> to do that how do you how does it how does it how does somewhere over how does somewhere overcome areas where there's you got that isolation between uh cultural groups ethnic mm. groups um because that's because i mean talking about birmingham talk or yeah. talking about london or talking about any big city like that mm. you i think you know in general you are much more you we mm. you are sort of much more accepting of the differences between the cultures because mm. you're just exposed to it visually all of the yeah. time. But it's also where radicalization is born uh, on both sides. When I say on both sides, I mean like white mm. flipping lunatic mm. nationalist mm. radicalization or not. How do you get both sides talking to each other? That's How do you overcome that? I, I I've done quite a lot of work on on engagement. Um, you know, unofficially as a journalist, but also as a filmmaker and, and, and as someone who's run projects, you've got to find common denominators. And, you know, we talked about Saragiri, we talked about, you know, seat contribution and, on, on, you know, during the world wars and all that. My my thing has always been to to utilize that shared history, that shared sense of service as as a common denominator that can bring people together, um, whether it be, you know, World War One, World War Two on the frontier or, or whatever. Uh, then and now to this day, you've got, you know, you've got Indians, you've got people that look like me and people that look like you who serve side by side in the British Army, for example. You know, there are common denominators. I, I when I was touring with some of my projects, I took it up to um, up to Scotland and, and, and some of those parts of Scotland where you've got small, vo you know, minority communities. Similarly, it was finding a common denominator. You can just get people around the table or together in a, in a school hall and say, let's talk about our shared history, our shared past. You know, when people realize actually they've got more in similarity, more in common with one another than, than what divides them, you can start having those conversations, you can start breaking down those barriers. But you will always inevitably get people who, you know, who, who, who push to the fringes. You know, you're absolutely right with that. And it's, it's a tough one. Um, and, you know, you've got to ensure that they're, they're in a minority by, by, by making it an unacceptable thing that, you know, isn't, you know, you don't shun it, you don't turn it off and you say, you know, but you've, you've got to find ways of bringing those people back into the fold. But, you know, by and large, you know, we've got to focus more on our similarities rather than our differences. 
And when people who are, you know, extreme in views, for example, whether they be political or, or anything else, um, realise actually that they're in a minority, if not, you know, they're standing in, 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 a, in a group of one, um, by and large, you can start changing behaviours. It's when you start giving, making excuses, you know, the whole woke thing, you know, making excuses or uh, allowing people to feel that actually it's acceptable to, to be intolerant in that way that people can get away with it because they think they've got an audience. More so now on social media, you wouldn't believe you know, some of the stuff I've seen on social media and, and also kind of received in terms of abuse. But you know, people do think it's, it's acceptable when you know, someone you know, gives them a like. Um, we've got to stop that sort of stuff. Mm, that is a challenge. That is a challenge on the old social media front. But yeah, I mean, I mean, on, on the on the on the on the racism front, they the, are going in the right direction. Um, it is reducing, and it's also a generational thing. Mm. You know, the reality is that I don't know, fifty years ago, two generations ago, mm. you know, sixties, seventies. The, it completely existed in in on, in massive you know in mm. legislation to, yeah. to separate people on based on based on race right and we, the further we get away from that the further you get away from people who still have that mindset mm. because it's the way they're brought up um anyway let's get off that topic <laughs> right mm -hmm. I, I do want to get off because i want to come back on to uh, the stuff we we're going to talk about um pcc police and crime commissioner mm. mate Unfortunately, you didn't get voted in. Mm -hmm. However, you, did you not achieve a quarter of a million votes? Yeah, I did, 259,000 Holy votes. shit. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank right. you. Um, what, was that? How, what brought you there? Why did you end up standing for Police and Crime Commissioner? For where? What was it for? Well, the whole of the West Midlands, so the seven boroughs was of it? the West Midlands. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a big area. So everything from Dudley down to Coventry, Wolverhampton, Solihull, Birmingham, Sandwell, um, uh, uh, Warsaw. Um, it's a big area, big area, three million people. Now, look, um, it... it you're a big lad. It, yeah. <laughs> it was a, and it was a two-year journey as well. I was told it was a six-month project and it turned out to be two years with, with lockdown <laughs> and everything. No, I always wanted to go into politics. You know, politics was, you know, where I, I always wanted to go. Um, I always saw it as, as a way of, you know, um, speaking up for people who, who don't have that opportunity to speak, you know, representing people who don't feel that they are being heard uh, and, and, and undertaking a public duty in that way. That's always been really important to me. Uh, but when I got asked if I was interested in, in, in the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner role, it kind of, you know, I thought about it for a second. I was like, well, hang on a second. You know, what does the role do? The, the, the three important parts of the, the PCC's role across whichever force area within uh, police force area it may be is to hold the, the chief constable to account who's in charge of operational decisions when it comes to policing in that area. It's to set the budget of the police force, so where the money goes, and it's to set the strategic direction of that force as well. And I thought, well, you know, I've got some serious issues where I live. They're trying to close our police station. They're taxing us more money, and yet we're not seeing more bobbies on the beat. So, you know, I feel quite connected to this because there's, there's a change here I want to see in my locality, but it's also a change I want to see in other areas that are deprived and, and, and feeling the effects of crime as well. So it kind of started making sense to think, actually, I, could, I can make a difference here. And that's, that's why I went for it when, when I was asked, would you? And I was like, actually, I can make a difference. I've got some ideas. I can bring some really interesting ideas from my career as a journalist or as a, as a soldier or within community engagement and actually you know, drive something here. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a step into politics, but I can kind of slightly sidestep a bit of the party political stuff because it should be above party politics. It should be a role that you know, you're, you're working for the safety and security of everyone regardless of party position and therefore you can get away f with you know not being political you know you don't have to be party political uh, in that way although you know i represent a party i'm proud to, to to be a member of a political party in the conservatives um and have been for a very long time so so that was the kind of what the driver and the, the motivator was for it and 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 you know i as i said i've, I've got a an army background not necessarily a policing background but the more i kind of got into it the more i thought actually you know what there are some ideas there's policies that i developed that i've you know felt were the right way of, of going about it and moving things forward um and yeah and we had a we had a um we had an election a few weeks ago and you're the you're the first interview i'm doing since then since i came second or since i lost let's be honest i lost um by forty thousand votes which is a, oh, a is kicker oh, yeah seven percent um, but you know, but as you say, you know, there's a significant number of uh, of uh, votes I pulled in, so something to be proud of. But also, you know, move the debate along. I, I I'm I'm proud of the fact that I move the debate onto issues that r people care about in in places like Dudley, and Sandwell, West Bromwich, for example, in in Coventry. 
um, in, in, in parts of Birmingham, Aston, you know, we've got knife crime, you've got serious murders and issues taking place, you've got, um, you know, antisocial behaviour, you've got not enough being done uh, to tackle um, so-called low-level crimes which irk people the most. Um, and we've we've been, you know, I felt the campaign I thought was 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 successful in getting a lot of these issues onto the agenda. Unfortunately, I'm I'm not there to be able to, to implement and, and and do anything about it, but someone else is. Um, but hey, that's that's politics. You know, it's 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 a it's a tough game. Mm, it's a tough game. You were talking about when we did the patron exclusive interview mm. right before this. You mentioned honesty and integrity. Right? Mm. How does that? <laughs> God, yeah. How do you balance? How does that work in politics? I don't know. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Oh it's my God. <laughs> do you know what? I and the reason I ask is I know I know decent good people are in politics, right? And yeah, you being one of them, right? <laughs> and uh, you know MPs and stuff, yeah. and. I also know that, oh God. It's a dirty game, isn't oh it? Oh, Christ, yeah. it's a dirty game. And it's a dirty, dirty game. Yeah. And how does that, pl- I, I just, how would you, how would you, man- how would you manage that as in terms mm. of, you know, in terms of your sort of morals and ethics and knowing that sometimes mm. to get what needs to be, d- there's reasons, right, for being dishonest. Mm. I understand it. I mean, mm. we sort of touched on it. There's mm. reasons for being dishonest. There are reasons why, information or data that later becomes known to the public isn't shared at the time and it's accused of manipulation or or there are lies made. I understand why. Mm. If you told the whole of the general Joe public all of the pieces of the pie, okay, we would be in a, and all the reasons like decisions are made and blah, 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 at the highest levels, we, it would not be a pretty state that we're in. It is not. Yeah. I understand it. I mean, but how, how are you going to, na- how do you navigate that minefield? I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, to be perfectly honest. Look, I, I came to this thinking, you know what? I, I want to be able to hold my head up with my kids and other people's kids and, and within, you know, within the wider community and wider society and say, actually, you know what? The, 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 the values that were, you know, that I, I, I stand by. You know, C drills, if you like. Um, but the values that I, I feel are really important are values that I espouse. And that's how I want to inspire others. Um, and, you know, and I think it's important to do that, at least, you know, to recognize you're, you're going into the process with, 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 with uh, you know, a set of ethics that, um, you know, yeah, they'll get tested. They'll, they'll you know, over time, they'll, they will be really, you know, um, possibly even watered down or, 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 or worked on. Um, but I think it's important if you, if you, you know, to, 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 to take the moral high ground. But like I said, you know, I, I, I felt I did so, but I, I didn't win. I don't know if I, if I had won, whether, you know, I would be challenged in that way. But I think it's, it's, it's a very human thing to think, you know, I'm going to stand by this set of cold or principles and, 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 and to be challenged to, to do so, whether it be only in your head or whether it be within a circle of peers or friends or, or even family who, who you can share that with. But look, I'll give you a, 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 an example. You know, on the campaign trail, I was accused of all sorts. I'm not going to go into detail, but um, I was accused of all sorts. I was called all sorts of things uh, by all sorts of people. Um, and, you know, my, my team kept telling me, you know, you've just got to rise above it. You've got to rise above it. And there was stuff that there's, there were things that were being said that I felt really strongly about. You know, I didn't get upset about it, but I was just fucking pissed off. Like, you know, how the how can anyone say that about me? You know, do they know who I am? Do they know what I've done? Do they know what you know I've achieved? No, they don't, because it's politics, and politics is making shit stick uh, to to you know to to malign your opponents or to make sure people don't vote for them. And there was all sorts of stuff going on. You know, some of it, um, a lot of it, I know about, um, but. Uh, Quite a bit of it was was under the radar, being accused of all sorts of stuff. Um, but you've you, you've just got to focus on the mission. That's what it's it's got to be about that. But in terms of, you know, I always felt strongly about, you know, the, the kind of person or the characters characteristics I wanted to 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 abide by or 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 or, or have in office. Um, should I be elected to office? And I think that's not changed at all. Um, you know, I, I still think it's it's important to be a person of character in public life, um, you know, and even if it's under tension, if it's you know if it's if it's under stress in terms of, you know, for example, giving someone your word or making a promise and then feeling you you know or, or not being able to deliver it, 
but you've, you've, you know, I just think you've got to be honest about it. We've, we've, we, we now need to see in our country um, dialogue and, and, and discourse that is more honourable than, than it, what it has been in the past. And I think we will get there. I think there's... there's you mean in politics? In politics, yeah. Um, women politics. Um, and I think we will get there. I think we'll get there when we've got some good people coming through. We've got quite a few people from you know, former military backgrounds, for example, who've been elected and, and, and are in the Commons. Uh, and we've we've got to keep working on ensuring that people who've got that you know public service background are coming forward as well, uh, and stepping forward to serve as well. That's the only way we're going to make change happen. Are you aware of? Um... Oh God, he's going to kill me. Uh, campaign. Uh... Oh, campaign for Johnny Ball. Yeah, yeah, I know campaign Johnny. For... Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> jo- I, yeah, had my head. I, I had in yeah. my head stand up, serve again. His slogan. Yeah, you, yeah, you, I know, you know I know, Johnny, yeah. I yeah, do yeah, know Johnny. Johnny's, yeah. Johnny's my former cat badge. Um, with Ink Corso, Johnny and I's, our careers, well, I keep knocking your night, our careers have kind of like ran almost parallel, but yeah, he's a good guy. He's a really, really good guy. Good guy. And, uh, so, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I understand what you mean. Um, in, I agree. Getting more ex-service personnel into politics, mm. politics would, would help steer it in the right direction, but I do think that it... it ah, man... One of the it's things tough. I think is maybe is the is the the length of term that PM serves is that too long too short? PM or MPs or PM PM too well, short? You know, you know we we've you, you, no I don't think it's too short. Um, I think because we have a you know parliamentary democracy with first past the post that leads to a strong government and a strong opposition. Um, you know the way our Volta system works ensures we have that and that's really really important and and therefore the you know the system favors the leader of the majority winning party and and therefore there's a lot of onus on people at the end of the day i mean i see arguments all the time about proportional representation but we i think have the best system in the world with with our current first past the poll system and therefore in terms of you know the the the, the prime minister um as long as the prime minister is able to to carry the support of the parliamentary party and and and, and the country in that way you know it's, it ensures that we have a strong prime minister. There's all sorts of noises going on out there. Yeah. You, I've just slightly... realised you haven't got your headphones on, so you can't hear it. Uh, or you can hear it better than me, yeah. Well, there's a rugby match on, so ah, I, right. I, I don't know what they're beeping at, but there's been... Anyway, sorry. Sorry for people listening or watching. <laughs> we, we can, you may not be able to hear it, but there's, there's horns beeping and all sorts of things. Um, sorry, the reason I, I was talking about the, the length of term of the PM is one of the things I think, rightly or wrongly, because I haven't really thought in depth about it is that when you have a, a length term which is what it's five years right for the pm mm. five years well, it's f- yeah five, it's well, fixed years. term parliaments been five years but they're changing it They've, it used to be four years and they became five years and it might very well become four again okay is that um f- you know f- for the benefit of the country and for people you need you need long-term strategy that, which mm. uh, long term isn't five years. Mm. For example, being greener, reducing carbon emissions, as as one example, mm. right? Mm. When you have a length of term that's only four or five years, whatever it is, or whatever it's going to be, it doesn't lend itself towards the party that's in power, whoever's in power, um, acting on things that are good for the long term. It lends itself to the party that's in power acting on quick, mm. quick gains, quick goals. Um, which may not necessarily be the right way forward. Mm. That was that was my thinking. So, so I think Tell most, me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, it's, 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 just thinking about you know when you compared to you know the American system for example, even the Russian system with five year presidencies, you know there there are four or five year terms. Um, you know governments will always make strategic decisions over the long term, um, but what's really really important is to ensure a cycle of ensuring people have their say. On, on the future direction. That's why when you go to an election, you know, people are voting for a political party's manifesto and what's going to be delivered. And we've just seen, you know, it might be a rarity to, to say this, but we've just seen with the COVID pandemic that actually, you know, shit happens, you know, things do change and, and things do change within that, that cyclical, in that cyclical way. Um, but like I said, I, I think we, you know, I think we have one of the best forms of democracy uh, in the world. Uh, because every four or five years people are given the opportunity to speak and you know we've seen renewal within a political party in power from um, with 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 the selection and election of Boris Johnson for example Um, and and that's the way it should be you should be able to have um, renewal 
in in a very orderly um, fashion without any disruption, which which is what our political system gives. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you find this. I know what you mean. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I need to think more. I need to think more about it. So, what's the next step? PCC, un unfortunately, unsuccessful. Unfortunately, yeah. would you stand again for it? No, probably not. Um, and that's being f really candid. I'm probably giving you an exclusive of, of, of not really <laughs> shit. With that. It was slightly slipped out. Um, no, I, you know what? I've I've been of the opinion that there were there were a number of factors that that really enticed me to go for it this time around. And I put my own kind of parliamentary ambitions on hold to, to do it. Uh, and the factors were the right factors. It was the right, the, the right reasons to do it. The, the right things I shared, you know, I, 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 um, I, I was passionate about and, and, and really um, wanted to see change and, and, and with the sorts of things that I, I felt I could do and deliver. Um, but there was a set kind of, there was a uniqueness around, around that period for why I ran. Um, so I, I probably, you know, famous last words, I, I don't think I would again um but it's um it's an interesting one you know you say uh, in terms of that we've not talked about my military career or or, or or background at all but i think you know being in the military makes you certainly a lot more resilient um but it also gives you that sense of you know wanting to you know be quite expeditionary you kind of strive and go into new areas and and, and challenge yourself to do new things and i think for me now it's i wouldn't want to repeat you know just try proving a point. Um, I would want to to actually genuinely explore new opportunities. I mean, that's not you know, having said that. You know, if 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 there were a new set of new factors and things changed, and 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 I was asked the question again, who knows? But I think having done it once and having you know done it over a sustained period of time, two years of campaigning, um, I'm I'm ready for a new challenge. Political challenge? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh definitely, definitely. What are you thinking? Uh, parliamentary. Um, it's always been my aspiration to go into, pol uh, into Parliament. Um, always has been, always will be. Um, and I think I've got a lot I can bring and, and do within, within Parliament. How does that... For f two questions. Mm. Where does that come from? And the second mm. one is, uh, how, does that, how does that tie in with you know, being a member of... You're a member of the reserves, right? Or are you, are you not anymore? Oh, I still am. I still am. Yeah, yeah. So 15 yeah. years reserves, right? Yeah, 12, 12, 13 now. Sorry, actually, 13, yeah. okay, right, yeah. So how does that work with yeah. being part of the military? Um, so, we, well, firstly, we've got, we've got serving MPs who are former military, uh, as well as currently reservists. But it's, it's a unique, I suppose it's a slightly unique thing with being a reservist where um, your, your, your terms of service or the service that you're in, in taking as a, uh, undertaking as a reservist allows that in terms of flexibility uh, to be able to do so. If you were full-time um, if you were a regular and you wanted to to serve or or stand, excuse me, <coughs> be an MP, um, you'd have to you know resign um, um, your commission or or, or leave, uh, and people do. But I think with the with the reserves, because you are uh, you have that kind of uniqueness, you're able to do both. And, and certainly there are a few MPs that do both. They they serve as reservists as well as being uh, sitting MPs, which is great. I think it's 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 very beneficial to to have that. Uh, ability uh, to still continue serving your country, particularly if you've you've done it for a period of time, uh, as well as um, you know bring that voice to bear in, in in a place like Parliament. But going back to your your original question again, it, it goes for me. It goes back to being sixteen, being in inner city Birmingham, and 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 just you know feeling that no one was listening to to my voice or people you know the, the community's voice, and and feeling the need to actually project that voice out there. What were the issues? You, what were the issues you were facing at the time? Uh, in the city of Birmingham, just just you know, um, just issues around poverty. Um, not to say that I was impoverished or anything, but just issues about lack of investments into inner city areas, jobs opportunities, job opportunities, particularly um, inner city crime. Um, I went to a grammar school. I should probably put this into context. So I went to a boys' grammar school, uh, Hands of Grammar, um, and um, you know the question mark over. Um, a lot of kids, certainly when I was growing up in the 90s, were, was you know about jobs. What are you going to do when you finish? Um, you know how are you going to get your your foot in the door of a, a a decent you know place of work and and have a good career? Uh, and I was lucky at being at a grammar school where you were pushed and you strived, and and certainly the the the, the with with the school I went to, a lot of emphasis was placed on on ensuring you you know you did well in your GCSEs and your A levels. But the thing that really made a difference for me was the fact that I could say I went to a grammar school. 
um, in terms of getting my foot in the door of you know university or jobs, etc. Um, for a lot of kids, and I knew a lot of kids from from other areas and uh, other schools, you know, it, the opportunities weren't always there. You really had to strive and do well. And if you didn't do well, you know, you could easily fall through the cracks. I had plenty of friends who fell through the cracks, failed in their A levels or failed in their GCSEs, mm -hmm. and and you know became drug dealers um, or, or 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 did other things. Um, and the, the, the kind of the important factor for, I think for a lot of people from my sort of background was the fact that you have that strong community support and, and ethos, um, uh, cultural values that really pushed you into, you know, staying on the straight and narrow. Certainly I did, and my, my, my family kept me on the straight and narrow, uh, as did my, 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 my religious community. Um, but, you know, the factors that came to play in the 90s were, were, were definitely there. Opportunities, jobs, education, um, housing still is an issue crime you know everything from well, well, just generally how crime has been dealt with lack of police officers all the way through to um you know the disproportionality you might say of of how certain people from certain backgrounds are 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 are, um, are treated in the eyes of the law um there, there, there were some serious issues which you know haven't really been dealt with or, or addressed um but you know politics as a means for creating change um, and I always think that um, it's it's really important people engage with the political process to do that, to have their voice heard, um, but also to you know, ensure change happens for the better, um, to get those resources, get those um, you know um, uh, get that investment into the areas that need it. Because if you know if you can't do it for politics, what can you do it through? Have you got politicians in the family? No, no. Have you got soldiers in the family? No. Okay, so why there is, well, how come you ended up joining up? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I'll, I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest son of the oldest son. Uh, my grandfather migrated to... to, to um, the oldest to, son of the oldest son? Yeah, my dad's the oldest right, as well. Okay, okay. So my granddad was uh, number four of five. Um, and you know his older brother came over from India in the si 50s and 60s, and then my granddad came over in the 60s. My dad was originally born in India, came Could over you just rock up 10. Then? Could you just rock up and get citizenship? So at that time, um, you could you could come over. Um, let me get this right. The don't it, incriminate anyone. It was it was a bit more straightforward. <laughs> it was a bit more straightforward. So what happened? They came during the period of of the 60s when Idi Amin was kicking um, Indians out from 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 from, from Uganda. Um, and and the the migration rules were a bit more flexible um, and a bit more straightforward. If you were coming from places like India or Uganda or Kenya or Tanzania, my wife's side of the family all came from from Kenya uh, around that same time, fifties and sixties. Um, they were a bit more straightforward. And funnily enough, you know, people don't forget about this. It was the Conservatives at the time and the Conservative governments that eased the the, the rules when it came to migration from former colonial areas like that. Um, Labour always a bit more tougher on um, on stopping restriction um, on on creating restrictions, but it was Conservatives that eased it up uh, because we had that historical connections and that and that there. But you know, migration or what we call the Great Migration of the '60s was very much based on the fact that there were there were a hell of a lot of um, manual labour jobs in in Britain, post-war Britain, um, that weren't being done by by people locally, and therefore Britain needed manual labourers. Why weren't they? Why weren't they? Yeah. Or why why weren't they being done by locals? Who knows? Who knows? Um, but they they weren't being done for whatever reasons and factors. So when my granddad came over, my granddad was a carpenter in India, um, but he came and worked in the foundries of of the. Or black was country. it? it was just, sorry, sorry, to interrupt. Or was it, it was just too much? Because it sounded like we were slagging off locals in sixteen seventies. Um, there must have been just too much demand for. It could have been, yeah. Much, it could, have, it could work, also have been demand, yeah. Post-war yeah, yeah, demand. Yeah, yeah. It could have very I much. I can't been imagine that, someone turning it down. <laughs> no, but there could be any any number of factors. But it could also be demand. But no, my 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 granddad came to work in the foundries of of the black country um, when when he came over in the sixties, um, because and there was work, there was there was jobs, there was a better opportunity, economic prosperity, um, and therefore you know that was a, a motivating factor for a lot of people from from my sort of uh, community. But in terms of you know my kind of family history um my dad left school when he was about 12 13 um as the oldest to go and work for the for the family um and therefore those opportunities weren't really there for my 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 parents generation um i was the first to go to to a grammar school 
uh, and the first to go to a university. And I just felt, I suppose, a bit of that pressure, but also I just wanted to, to strive. I just wanted to work hard. I was also very lazy as well at one point, but I, I just felt like I needed to be in a, you know, <laughs> you know, kids are lazy generally, but, you know, it was a different type of lazy. It's not like lazy these days with PlayStations and, <laughs> and Netflix. It was, you know, it was lazy just, you know, kicking a football around the, you know, the streets or whatever, that sort of thing, rather than, you know, working or, or reading textbooks or, or studying. Um, but no, I just I just felt I wanted to do stuff and and, and be, be become someone, be not quite be famous, but just be be doing like really interesting stuff that no one had done before, and that's what really pushed me. Um, and and journalism, as I said, came, came about because of my interest, and in, I was good at writing. But you know, the, the, the kind of the military stuff was always there as I was an air cadet um, with the RAF cadets. Um, tried to join the RAF at eighteen, um, but had a slight issue with my eyesight, so they struck me off. Um, but that that sort of that that kind of that itch was always there, and again, you know, it was, it's based on again growing up and hearing the stories of the fact that Sikhs had served during World War One, World War Two, and and Frontier, but also kind of you know more historic than that, you know, Sikh contribution, Sikh bravery and valor in the battlefield. It was these are all stories I grew up on, um, and and you know, part of it might have been trying to kind of emulate or, or, or thinking I could try emulating it, but. I just had that interest in 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 in, in, in the military. A lot of Sikh VC winners is one of my first realizations of, you know, the, the contribution of uh, of nations other than Britain mm. during during the, during the time of the British Empire during the First and Second World Wars when I walked into the Union Jack Club mm. Hotel in London mm -hmm. and they got all the VC winners on all the walls. Yeah, and I was like, man, there's a lot of not white faces here. Yeah, <laughs> I gotcha. need to read some alley people, yeah, some alley oh, stories, man. man. Unbelievable. Oh, Unbelievable. you got some fantastic stories. Like Kadar did the Khan, the first one, World War II, uh, World War One. Got some World fantastic World uniforms as well. Yeah, and this is, <laughs> I mean, and and you know, the great thing is, you know, these were these were innovations by the British to you know accommodate native, you know, what they called native soldiers and and and. Um, um, and, 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 and native officers into kind of the system. My turban is one of those innovations. You know, the fact that my turban is pleated, folded neatly um, and, and, and ironed, but certainly pleated was, was an innovation that the British brought up. It's really? Not as if, yeah, God, yeah, yeah. Going back 300 years, you know, Sikhs didn't pleat their turbans. You know, it was a thing that the British thought, you know what? Sikhs wear turbans, not just Sikhs, by the way, other, you know, other natives, you know, Rajput, Hindu Rajputs or, or, um, or, or Patans, they ha all had their different types of headdresses based around turbans as the, as the local kind of, you know, custom and formality. Um, but the British got them to, to pleat them, <laughs> which is brilliant. Um, it's a, a really funny story, actually. I should tell this story. Uh, when I was in Washington, I lived with this, um, with this Nigerian girl, um, um, in, 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 and, um, and I, I'd wash my turban one day. And I, you know, my turban's a, a big, long piece of cloth, you know, nearly six foot long. Uh, and I, I fold it and I iron it. And, you know, I had to ask her to help me. I was like, do you mind just helping me? I just need to fold it like this. And you, I have to fold it like this. And she's like, oh, yeah, I don't have to do that. We did that to our bed sheets. I was like, you what? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, wherever the British went, including in Africa with the Ethiopians, for example, as well, the Ethiopian rifles, um, and in South Africa as well, they had this tradition um, and then they, they embraced it and, and we forget about that. You know, we forget about our customs and traditions, but like you say, you know, you walk into the union Jack, just like if you walk into the in and out or you walk into Royal military Academy, Sandhurst and old college, you'll see all these images, which is, you know, part and parcel of our history. Um, but you, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's not known about more, more, um, more, um, in, more in the mainstream, but you know, we certainly get a view of it through the military. Yeah, definitely. Wait, what's the relevance of the turban in, ter from, in Sikhism? Yeah, so... Um, Excuse my ignorance as well. But no, not at all. Um, always happy to, to answer the question. So Sikhs, we don't cut our hair. So, you know, hair is sacred for us. We, we maintain long, <coughs> uncut hair. And the way we um, fashion it, if you like, you know, keep it smart, be presentable, but also encase our hair and our head and our cranium and look after our heads is with a turban. Uh, and there's a science behind it as well with the turban as well, because when you're, whether you're praying or doing good, you're, you're, you're taking positive energy from the, from the earth's core, from the ground up. And, you know, it's connected to what's in your head, which is the third eye, if you like, or what we call the Dasam Dwar, the 10th doorway, that connection you have, that spiritual connection you have. And so with a, t with a turban, any positive energy that you're, 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 you're bringing up and harnessing through your good deeds is maintained on your, on your person with the turban. Um, 
so that's where it comes from. But also, it's, it's, it's a really important part of our identity, you know, how we project ourselves, how we present ourselves. And it's often said, you know, with a Sikh with a turban, you can't hide in a crowd. Everyone knows who you are. And that's purposely so as well. So you are upstanding in society and you do take a stand. And people know as well, you know, if they need a help, if they need, if they need help, if they need to turn to someone, you know, you're identifiable. They come to you and you've got that. Um, you're, you're obliged uh, to help people. Do different colours mean things? Yes, they do. Ooh, I just popped them out. <laughs> do you know why? Because it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's an Indiana Jones film and one of the, it's, it's a big orange, someone with an orange turban, really prominent. And when you were talking about the crowd, you guys, yeah. I remember it's, it's, it's walking through the crowd with a big orange turban. I, I should probably declare at this stage. Hang on. Does, bad, does bla a black turban mean a bad thing? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so, so traditionally, I should sorry, declare mate, this. No, sorry, no, it's fine. Sorry. I'm happy. Lonely, warts and all, warts and all. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll happily declare. I'll, I'll, I should declare that. Shit. Traditionally, I'll, I'll caveat it. Traditionally, um, black was a, a colour of protest against the British, uh, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is where it comes from. Uh, really? But you know, I wear black because black matches everything. Yeah, 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 black yeah, goes yeah. everything. No, the traditional colours. Black wasn't black. Wasn't a black. Um, within Sikhdom, the two traditional colours are, are blue and orange. Uh, or it's, it's actually saffron. It's, it's off orange. Um, it's not quite orange. I'm just trying to find a, an example around here. It's more kind of yellowy. Um, and those are the two traditional colours. The so blue um, was the traditional colour. You know, you take shelter underneath the, the sky and blue is that colour of empowerment. Orange is a colour of empowerment as well. White is uh, traditionally a saintly colour. Because you know white cleanliness, but also against white you can see when something's dirty, so you know you know to to get it washed. But white is a color of cleanliness. Um, red or a kind of a, a ready pinkish color is more of the kind of the matrimonial color. Um, it's it's what you traditionally wear when you're getting married, because it's the color that um, um, traditionally has been worn um, around marriage. Green is a Sufi color. So Sufi Muslims will predominantly wear green in Afghan and places like that. You'll see a lot of green being worn. Um, a lot of the darker colours as well, um, and that probably covers off the main ones, um, and then everything else is you know. But the, by and large, these days, you know, you can choose. Wearers, you can it's, choose. Just, it's it's just fashion, isn't it? It's it's fashion. It's whatever colour, you know, suits your personality, or you like, or you, or you, um, or you want to match with whatever you're wearing. Mm. Um, I, I've dabbled in colour. Um, so as ink core, my turban was slime green. <laughs> it was cypress <laughs> green. I had one. Uh, funny story with that. The pastel said, "Oh, go find a turban. I don't know where to get them from." I was like, "Yeah, cool. I'll get them off. You know, from from turban shops in Saharald in Birmingham. That's cool. Yeah, because um, they don't. You know, we don't hold onto stocks and stocks of turbans in stores or anything." Um, and then when I rebadged, um, it's it's a it's a darker blue, which is easier. But you know, it's it's great these days. I saw I saw someone. Um, I saw R and P. Someone wearing a red one um, with with R and P. Uh, and I've seen a marine wear a white one with a with a red band as well, which looks pretty smart as well. So you know you, you you're getting all sorts of colours these days with with Sikhs joining turban wearing Sikhs joining various regiments and units. Hmm. I, learned, yeah. I learned something, mate. Interesting. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And you know what? You know, I I always think you know if anybody ever wants to know anything, just you know don't be shy to ask. You know, we've got to break down these barriers. Well, you got the problem at the moment these days, which <laughs> I think is dying. I was talking to Gaz Sunita's Guild, mm. Gaz, and if you know him. Um, the, uh, the other day about it seems to me you know, again inverted commas wokeism you know like flipping hard left lun lunacy right um, seems to be dying <laughs> off now. Mm. I think you know it's, it's not as bad as well it's it's on we're coming back to normality right we're coming back to normality do you know an example do you know what I haven't heard of uh, for a while is uh, cultural appropriation mm. I know I'm getting accused of cultural appropriation I take it back you heard of that some an occasion it happened yesterday with one of the Kardashians who 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 dreadlocked or pleated their hair oh, really? and they got accused of cultural appropriate fuck off um, but it does seem to be on, on, um, dying down but going back I mean the reason I mentioned this you're on about you know just don't be afraid to ask people about differences mm. but people are so worried about offending people that's what it is they're worried about offending people and yeah. getting and getting the, yeah. the finger pointed at them for being yeah. this that or x y or z racist or um, yeah. or, or uh, anti Feminist or transphobic yeah. or flipping, yeah, you, can't, you know, yeah. again, which stifles the conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I, I know the look, by the way. There is a look. Um, there, <laughs> there is a there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a white person look, usually white male look, that I know that That's look. racist. That's can't racist. That. Yeah, racist. call it out, call right. it out. <laughs> No, but no, there no. is there is a there is a white male look that I know really really well. Have I done it? I, I, no, you've not done it actually. Oh, no, no, you've no, not. Really <laughs> but I've seen it so many times where. Go on. 
it's, it, I, I'm probably not doing it really, really right. I look probably really constipated, but you're looking. It, there's, there's, a look where, yeah, you're, you're there's, looking. there's a look can where. There's a look where. Can I ask a question? Can I not? That kind of thing. No. Yeah, and it's that kind of slight hesitancy, and, you, and and the eyes will be like. <laughs> and, and I know the look, and I know the look, and I've seen it so many times, and and I, I know whenever I see the look, I'm like, mate, just what do you want to know? Uh, let's just talk about it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I think you know, for me, and I, I'll say this personally, but I, the, the word of advice I would give to anyone is: look, you know, if you want to know, just ask the question, and ask the question in in as in as a respectful way as you can. But you know, do me a favor: just don't ask the question if you're drinking or if you're drunk, because you know people will. No, sorry about that. No, we're having a conversation because I've seen it the other way as well, which is you know people you know have a couple of pints or whatever, and they're at the pub, and it will just come out wrong. Yeah, is is yeah, is, yeah. is the reason why I say it? Yeah. So you know, nothing wrong with asking. You know, please do ask. You know, but you know, just 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 be mindful of of you know, you know, being respectful because the person hearing it might not necessarily think you're being disrespectful, but it might come across in a kind of slightly weird way, and and they might get defensive, and then it just you know it it just gets mm. it, you know it's it's a downward trajectory. Awkward. It gets awkward, awkward. but you know, it, awkward's the the polite way of saying it. You know, I've seen it <laughs> I've seen it go horribly wrong where, you know, the person asking just did it in the wrong way. Um, and the person responding. You what know, was the question? It was something about you know turban. You know why? How would you tie that? You know something like that. But the, the person who who was responding, they should have been a bit more kind of aware. Of, situational awareness should have been there, and they should have just realised actually he's had he's had a few to drink, and you know what? It you know I'm sure he's a nice guy, but you know it doesn't need you to then be a dick yourself. So you know just ask the question, please, but just be mindful. And people, I always say to to, to Sikhs and, and others, you know, if someone asks you something, you know, just again, just you know, just be mindful. Um, you know, we all get out. You know, everyone gets their Dutch courage, and and feels like you know they want to ask questions, but sometimes it's not the right place to do it. But yeah. there shouldn't be there shouldn't be anything wrong with asking. You know, excuse me, what's your? Could you tell? Please, could you explain what yeah. your turban's about? Or please, could you explain what your beard's about? Or, yeah. or whatever. And and we can have respectful conversations that way. I love it, mate. I think we're incredibly lucky. I do. I think when I say we, I mean people who reside in Britain. Mm. We are incredibly lucky. In that we live in, we do live in an incredibly diverse country. I I flipping love it. Hmm. Um, from diversity of the people, diversity of the cultures, diversity of geographic diversity, mountains, gotcha. no mountains, coast, no coast. Yeah. Flipping, you know, um, and uh, and we should take advantage of it. You yeah, know, absolutely. We were talking. We were, we were talking earlier about, or you were talking earlier about, you know. Uh, cultural isolation uh, you know communities not uh, getting involved with each other to, and again that's that's a like a, not a symptom it's a, it's a cause of culture you know they they tend to it, it's a it's the evolutionary defense mechanism yeah. to stick stick with your own people right yeah. but also an evolutionary defense mechanism to know as much as you can about other things no, exactly. you know knowledge right and uh we we should we should want to yeah. know we should want to experience or understand other people's experiences because yeah. they know, like you know stuff I don't know. I know stuff you don't know. You've got amazing experiences that I have not had, and I want to mm. know about those things. And vice versa. And vice versa. You know, you come a co you come you come from a completely different mm. world than what I do. You've a completely mm. different upbringing from what I've had. Completely different parenting, mm -hmm. and all down to the fact that y you're not the same mm. as me. Mm. <laughs> you know, but you know. I think you know. But this strength when we come together, and, and that's the point. You know, you, you nailed it on the head. You know, I might know stuff that you don't, but you know, you certainly know stuff that I don't. And there is strength in coming together. And, and I, you know, I certainly see this in the army and the army of today, uh, our modern army, and, and, and with you know diversity and, and the ability to reach into and, and, and recruit different people of diverse thinking and, and ways of life, you know, is a strength because then we've got new ideas, we've got original ways of thinking, we've got different ways of doing things. You know, we've got co creativity when you when you when your one ups allow you to be creative. You know, you, you've got so many different things coming in, and it has to, and it should be a strength. And we certainly in our country, I don't think you know, play to our strengths enough, because we we get you know we get we get bogged down in these stupid debates, you know we get bogged down into oh can we talk about this can we not talk about that can we should it be like this should it be like that, and and you know I'm certainly of the opinion that you know there are there there are always malign agendas, but you know we should be more resilient to that, and we should be certainly more forward thinking in th in in believing that you know. If if you know people within my team speak different languages, for example, that that's empowerment. You know that means we can cover off so many bases. You know if people bring different things because they've seen things differently culturally or religiously or whatever, that that's an empowerment that makes our unit, our team stronger. And it would be certainly true in, in a business world, and it's certainly true in a military world. Um, we've got to place our strengths. I absolutely agree, mate. The greatest teams, are, are, are the greatest teams, one of the qualities of, of of good teams, effective teams, is diversity. Diversity. 
Um, and hey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Have we anything you wanted to cover that we haven't covered? Oh god, yeah, we've spoken about so many things. I think we've covered quite a lot, isn't it? I mean, um, it's yeah. been a good conversation. I've really enjoyed yeah. it, mate. Really enjoyed Me too. it. Um, how can people uh, track you, follow you, <laughs> see what you're doing? I'm active on Twitter, J Sing Soho at J Sing Soho. Um, just yeah, find me on Twitter. Is usually spell fine. it out. Spell it out. Uh, letter J, S I N G H S O H A L. Um, more than happy to 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 take a DM or if you want to um, drop me. Facebook's exactly the same as well. But um, yeah, quite active on Twitter at the moment. Okay, perfect, mate. And um, if you do, or when you do, <laughs> end up uh, taking that next step into politics, I wish you the very best of luck, mate. Thank you. And all Thank honesty. You. And um, Right, let's do this again sometime. Absolutely, would love to. This has been brilliant. Thank Great. you for having me. Cheers, buddy.